Great. Well, welcome to Delaware's Rare Disease Day event. Thank you all so much for joining today. We are excited to be celebrating the rare disease community with all of you. So I am going to kick it off with a few welcome videos. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. Jag är en kristian och jag bor i Norge. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunisia, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minha sorotan. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Ana penda com ita zama niki poliza ma povo. Já eles queridos, o hospital espil me família não men. Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me pulogue. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavyofurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik perhubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Och var övinge på grund av människorna runt mig. Their fierce support. Så bondad i nabalavio. The big big love. Mina vänner. Kluaga. Infermeras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistenter. Masirika ya wagonjwa. Together we are a strong community. Ni meweza kuelekewa. Historias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, kama seltelis. I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has cask, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafiq dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leiomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you need, Harvey? Ana SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Eu não queria ser um ai raro, ui, me foi bem chorar. Esta é minha vida. Suara saia. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Camira mãe. Nós somos fortes. And we are proud. Welcome, I'm Peter Saltonstall, President and CEO of the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. But before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislatures, where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system for all of you that are watching today, the importance of the Rare Disease Advisory Councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. Without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at NORD and the patient community.
Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare and together we are strong. Great. So we are just giving a brief disclaimer is that we, um, NOR does not provide any medical advice or um, any, it does not endorse any specific treatments. So this is just a brief disclaimer. It'll also be dropped in the chat box if you'd like to take a closer look. With that, I will turn it on over to Irfan. Thank you, Anissa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Irfan Patel. Um, I'm, a, I'm a patient, caregiver, and advocate for, for the rare disease community. Today, I am honored to welcome you all on behalf of NORD in my capacity as the co-ambassador for Deliver Rare Action Network to our rare disease 2021 virtual program. As we have learned the hard way, virtual is a new norm here. As we all know, the last day in February is commemorated as the Rare Disease Day across the globe. In our rare disease community, we follow the mantra that alone we are rare, together we are strong. So the whole idea behind these RDD events is to raise awareness on this cause. It's about building synergy across the globe, whether it's the lighting of a bridge in Brisbane, Australia, in support of Rare Disease Day, or the planned lighting of Ben Franklin Bridge up in Philly this evening. It's all about connecting the community together. Today, we have a rich list of distinguished speakers amongst us that includes our Lieutenant Governor Whitney Hall Long, an ardent supporter of Ray disease community and special needs community in our state. We'll also hear from Rep. Paul Bambach, who will be joining us 15 minutes into the program and also a recorded video message from Senator Nicole Poor, who, uh, who couldn't join us uh, due to a last minute conflict. And then we also have patients and caregivers who will share their rare disease journey with us. That includes Jim Burroughs, uh, Stephanie uh, Kozain, who is also a co-ambassador for, for Deliver RAN. And then I'll also share my, my journey with you all. And then we also have NORD staff members who will be talking about the Deliver State Report Card. We are a small state. We have done a lot of great things, but we still have quite, quite some gaps that we need to address as a community. So we will, we will, uh, we'll, we'll talk through those things. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Anissa. Anissa, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, I am the State Policy Manager for the Eastern Region here at NORD. I'm gonna do a brief overview of what a Rare Disease Advisory Council is and what our state report card focuses on. So let's start with the problem. More than 25 million Americans are living with one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. That breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. So even though that might seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. So what is the solution? Nord believes it is to create RDACs, a diverse body to advise state government on the common obstacles that the rare disease community faces. We see this as an enormous opportunity for government officials and the rare disease community to work together to develop resources necessary to prevent and address barriers in a strategic way. There are a number of differences between each RDAC uh, in different states. This includes the number of members on the council, varied members of the rare disease community represented on the council, differences in where the council works out of, funding, and duties and accountability mechanisms. So overall, each RDAC has the same goal of supporting the rare disease community by increasing the voice of rare disease patients and caregivers at the state level. So to date, 16 states have passed RDAC legislation, and at this time we're also having several RDAC bills that are currently being heard in several other states.
So as mentioned, we are thrilled that we've seen so much momentum this year um, with RDAX. So we are thrilled um, that we are building several coalitions in other states. Uh, many rare disease advocates um, are getting more of a voice in state government and NORD highly encourages that different state RDACs collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. We plan to continue to develop and release toolkits and one pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support ongoing RDAC work. So what is Delaware's RDAC status? So at this time, Delaware does not have an RDAC in place. However, we have several great advocates in the state who are passionate about the rare disease um, community. So within the next few months, we do hope to begin building a diverse coalition to discuss what the rare disease community in Delaware would like to see in an RDAC and work together to push legislation across the line. Uh, if you're interested in getting more involved in these efforts, then please email rdac at rarediseases.org. Uh, also happy to answer any additional questions towards the end. So now I'm going to jump into an overview of an important tool that we use at NORD. In 2015, NORD launched its state report card project with the goal of evaluating how effectively states are serving people with rare diseases. This year marks the sixth edition of the state report card, which was compiled using data current as of November of 2020. So these are the policy issues that NORD's report card focuses on. It is important to note, however, that these issues are not exhaustive. These issues touch on several critical and relevant policy areas at the state level, but with each issue included, there are still many others that are capable of impacting the lives of rare disease patients. So how do you find out where your state measures up? Um, you can select your state by using this link that is right here. Uh, each state's page is also available in a printable version. So uh, again, these are just small snapshots of some policy issues that impacted the rare disease community in 2020. Current legislation and changes that have been made so far in 2021 have not yet been captured. So if your state recently passed legislation to improve one of the policy issues, they might not have um, a higher grade. In our sixth edition, you'll likely see it changed in the seventh. The website provides a detailed overview of the data and you can learn more about each policy issue in the methodology section. So if you have any questions about our report card, then you can always send us an email at policy at rarediseases.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Irfan again to introduce our first speaker. Thank you so much, Abby. No, sorry, uh, Anissa. Mm -hmm. um, now with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, she has been a great supporter of the rare disease community and especially its community, uh, even before she became the Lieutenant Governor, right? From the moment she was representing my district she was the first one who, uh, who I got in touch with, uh, gosh, like six years ago to introduce a concurrent resolution uh, in the state house to recognize Ray Disease Day. And, and again, uh, Lieutenant Governor, we are so thankful and humbled by your presence here, despite your hectic schedule, calling it hectic is an understatement. So with that, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to join all of you today. It is truly so important, the work that you are doing whether a parent, a sibling, a neighbor, a caregiver, or a health provider, someone who's giving the care. And I'm excited to know that you had two of Delaware's incredible members of our General Assembly joining you in Senator Nicole Poor, as well as Representative Bombach. I know Senator Poor will be in video, but her commitment and her lived experience and journey with her family um, makes her such an incredible advocate. And I know with Representative Bombach as well, Having been a senator and a representative, and most importantly as a mom and a health provider, as a professor of nursing at the institution, they call it the SHIP Institution here in Delaware, the University of Delaware, I really am very committed to working with families and our legislators to make advances, no matter what the background, no matter the disease. And as you indicated, um, you know, rare diseases, 7,000 of them affecting one in 10 
Americans and here in Delaware as well is significant. And I'm incredibly impressed uh, by your initiatives that you've laid out, uh, your report card, as well as the opportunity to come together to form an advisory council. Um, I think those are important steps, your knowledge, your awareness and behavior. And Efron, as he indicated, I know we met when I was campaigning and going door to door and we shared the story that you will hear in a moment of your family's experience. But to all those who are listening in and all those who are participating, my team today, I'm joined by Abby, you know, Betts will tell you there's not a week or two that goes by that we don't hear from a family member, a caregiver, whether it's an insurance issue, whether it's an issue with housing, a transportation issue, persons who are experiencing uh, rare health disorders have unique needs. And I have to say thank you to all of you for stepping up and advocating is really important, particularly when it comes to the journey and the challenges that you've faced uh, with insurance, procedures, um, and the daily stress. And keep in mind, as an advocate myself, someone who is very much attuned to the whole person, the whole family, the emotional and behavioral health stress that this also causes for families. But I'm a woman of optimism and a leader who is so thrilled to join you that I know together, as you indicated, if I love how you said alone, you're rare, but together you're strong. And I'm very optimistic. And I am one who sees each and every one of us as not having a, a word, I, I don't like the word disability. Um, I really like difference and I like ability so much better. So I think together we can make a difference. And I'm honored as Delaware's Lieutenant Governor to be with you, but also as the chair of the National Lieutenant Governors Association to say thank you for what you're doing across our nation. As I work with other Lieutenant Governors, not only in our domestic continental borders, but in our territories, we have to say thank you for what you are doing to advocate for those approximately 30 million individuals. And here in Delaware, I'm pleased to be part of the advocates who are standing up as well as our members of the General Assembly. So on behalf of Governor Carney, myself, a sincere thank you, best wishes as we recognize your work both nationally and at the state with Rare Disease Day. And so Efron, thank you um, so much to you and the national organization for inviting me to have a few moments with you today. Consider my office always accessible and available and I'm very happy to assist you with your policy agenda here in Delaware but also across our country in the other hat that I wear with the NLGA. So back to you, Ifran. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor, Whitney Hall Lung. Uh, like I said, you have been a great supporter. And as we are laying out our, our RDAC roadmap for, for the state of Delaware, I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you. Uh, so will be the, the other members of NORD. Absolutely, thank yep. you. Yep, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our next speaker uh, who will be virtual, virtual, right? Like, you know, so we're okay, in virtual we're program, but she'll be, she'll be using the recorded, 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 recorded message, message here. here. Oh, I think oh, I, I hear yeah. echo. Okay. So like I said at the beginning, uh, Senator Nicole Poor, uh, she had a last minute conflict, but she was kind enough to, to take time to record this message for, uh, for the Ray Disease Day. Anissa, go ahead. Thank you. Anissa, oh, I need you. I hope this video message finds you healthy, safe, and well. Normally, I would be welcoming the whole Patel family and many of you to Legislative Hall with open arms as we mark Rare Disease Day here in Delaware. This pandemic has required sweeping changes in how we work, how we shop, and how we interact with friends and family. Very few have been impacted by COVID-19 in the same way as the families I'm speaking to today. I've met many of you, and I know the difficulties you face in a good year. I know personally what it's like to have a child with special needs who needs extra special protection at a scary time like this. In some ways, the rest of us are now experiencing the lives each of you have been living through for years as we await new therapies that can help give us the peace of mind we desperately want for our parents, our siblings, and our children. That is why I've worked so hard during my career to be the voice for our most vulnerable neighbors. It's also why we take time each year to recognize those of us who are dealing with the variety of challenges, such as genetic disorders, illnesses, and diseases 
especially those conditions so rare that they never get the recognition they deserve. One in 10 people in the United States are affected by one of the 7,000 diseases and conditions considered rare, and each of them are facing greater challenges than ever before during this trying time. I promise you that our state public experts are working round the clock to get life-saving vaccines out to you as quickly as they come off the assembly line. And I'm also working around the clock to make sure you and your families are getting the support and attention you deserve. Thank you to the Patel family and each one of you who have reached out to talk to me about the challenges that you are facing. I promise you, you're not alone. Together, we'll get through this. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Please reach out anytime so that I can provide you with any assistance, comfort, or just even a friendly conversation. Have a great day. So like I said, we'll send a thank you message to Senator Nicole Poor's office. And I would like to introduce Jim Burroughs, who is a patient caregiver and advocate for his daughter, Amanda, who has Schoen syndrome. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Jim. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, Irfan and I go way back to our uh, days on the Family Advisory Council at AI DuPont. So it was, um, it's an honor to, uh, to tell a little bit of, of Amanda's story, uh, a little bit of her family and, and some of the um, struggles that, you know, we and, and other families across the state um, see. Um, Amanda was born, she's now 13 years old, and she was born with uh, a rare um, congenital heart condition called Schoen's syndrome. I, I had never heard of it. In fact, it took uh, probably a good year or two before we got that, that exact diagnosis. And what that really or basically means is that the left side of her heart had multiple malformations, which um, individually are um, less uh, rare, but the, given the whole package of everything that worked together, it, it's definitely on the rare side. Um, she has now had seven open heart surgeries, uh, three of them here in Delaware, and um, eventually we had to transfer her surgical care up to Boston um, for another uh, four surgeries. And, um, you know, Lieutenant Governor Hall Long had mentioned the stress, and um, I hadn't planned on really talking about this part of it, but, um, you know, it, it, it definitely resonated. Um, the reason we ended up in Boston was because um, she, we ran out of surgical options here, and her cardiologist and um, surgeon basically gave us three options. For option one was do nothing and see how long she lives and keep her comfortable. So that, that wasn't gonna be an option. Option two was to list her for um, a heart and lung transplant, which you know she was less than one. So the chances of that happening were basically slim to none. And then option three was a, a very risky um, experimental almost surgery where there's about a 50-50 chance that she wasn't gonna make it. So you know those, uh, those three options certainly added a level of stress to our, to our lives, but we were lucky in that her surgeon um, suggested a, a second opinion from us, one of his uh, colleagues in Boston. And that's how we um, ended there or ended up there. And, you know, before we jump into some of the challenges that, you know, families like ours face, I do want to mention that we were on the lucky side in terms of, you know, we're lucky to have caregivers that um, set aside any kind of personal bias and suggested a, a second opinion. Uh, we were lucky that we had great commercial insurance, um, you know, to, to allow us to, to go to Boston. And, and I was personally lucky to have a flexible job where I could do that. So, you know, thinking of some of the challenges, not all families across the state, obviously, are going to be as lucky as we were in, in terms of some of the, um, you know, um, flexibility and resources that we had. Um, but, you know, if you think about specifically some challenges, what really sticks out to me was the lack of a playbook, if you will, on how to, you know, care for a child like Amanda, uh, but more specifically, the resources available to us through the state. You know, eventually we picked up things from our social worker here and there, um, but really 
you know, that the, the amount of information that any one family would get is really dependent on how good your social worker is and, and how well connected into the state resources. So, you know, that was tough. Um, even though, you know, I considered myself fairly educated, uh, that master's degree uh, doesn't really matter too much when you have a, a child at home and you think, uh oh, um, let me make sure I don't do anything that's going to make her condition worse. But, um, you know, you like, like all other families, when you don't have much of a choice, you kind of get through it and, and you figure it out. Um, but, you know, thinking back on, you know, if I could say, you know, what would have made it a little bit easier would have been, you know, that, that almost that manual of here are all the different resources across the state. It may, it, it, like I said, it may, it, it may um, exist today. I, you know, Amanda's now 13, so it's been a while since we had to worry about that. But, you know, back then there really wasn't. And then the only uh, other, you know, thought I had um, around some challenges would be, you know, with the population of, of kids like Amanda um, in the state being, you know, on the smaller side, and, you know, that 10% number was, was the first time I had heard that. And, you know, if you think about Delaware and, and the amount of kids like her, it, it would be a small um, absolute number. And so it's easy to not forget about them, obviously, but, you know, sometimes you get lost in the shuffle. Uh, and I'm not talking like with pharmaceuticals and, and things like that, although that does happen. But, you know, we'll give you, I'll give you a real life example of what we're living through right now, um, you know, with the, with the pandemic. So Amanda's 13, so she's not um, old enough to get a vaccine. Um, I am not, not yet anyway, sometimes I feel like it, <laughs> I'm not old enough to, to qualify based on my age. You know, thankfully, uh, and luckily, I don't have any pre-existing conditions that would, you know, accelerate me for any of those reasons. However, with Amanda's cardiac condition, if, if I or her mother or, or anyone around her were to, you know, get sick and pass it along to her, that can be pretty devastating um, for a kid with a cardiac situation. And, and not only just the cardiac, children, but immunosuppressed kids, you know, any of these um, rare diseases, it's going to be pretty challenging for them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're extremely cautious, you know, we're just waiting in, in line for when we can get that vaccine. But it's things like that, where, you know, if you're not living with this day to day, it's easy to, to kind of set that aside and, and um, not really think about it. But, you know, all in all, the we're very lucky, as I said before, Amanda's doing great. You know, you may actually hear her in the background. She's, uh, she's enjoying herself over in the, uh, in the other room there. Um, but we, we are lucky. Uh, we are very supported by the state with all the different programs. And so um, I'm just, again, happy to have shared the story and, and thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing the story. And, and, and I have to say that my daughter, Khatija, uh, I mean, she, she was in the same class as Amanda. So it's like, you know, the kind of bond these kids share, right? And it, it's amazing. It's like, you know, yeah. Right. Okay, great. So now I would like to uh, invite um, another patient caregiver, uh, Stephanie Kozine. She is also a co-ambassador for the Deliver RAN Network, my partner in crime in, in our state. <laughs> who's going to share her son uh, Ethan's journey with, uh, who's diagnosed with uh, MPS1 Hurler syndrome. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't misspoke on that one. It's Hurler, right? Hurler syndrome. Yeah, Hurler syndrome. Hurler, okay. Correct. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Cozine. I'm not originally from Delaware. Um, and my son was actually born in the state of Texas. Um, Texas does not have Hurler syndrome on their newborn screening panel. Um, though it is recommended on the RUSP. Um, we started seeing symptoms really early on, um, probably around three months old. I had noticed a curvature in his spine. Um, uh, we ended up doing x-rays. We were sent to an orthopedic surgeon at Texas Children's. The orthopedic surgeon there told me that it was a birth defect, that he would live a perfectly normal life. He just wouldn't be able to play football or join the military. Um, with that information, um, like any new mother, of course, I was devastated even with that um, because his father was in the military and was very active in athletics. 
Um, then my husband was transferred up to the Northeast, um, to New Jersey, and we uh, were looking for a home in the tri-state area of Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. Um, I decided to go ahead and get another opinion. Um, we were gonna have to do a follow-up in a year anyway. Um, so I reached out to an orthopedic surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, Dr. Cahill, and he was able to get us in pretty quickly. Um, he saw my son, he said, you know, he's needing his milestones. There isn't anything physically, um, you know, concerning other than this curvature in his spine, but I am gonna send you to cardiology and genetics just in case we're missing a larger picture. So he was able to fast track us. Within two weeks, um, we were able to see the cardiologist who again said, you know, there's a couple of abnormalities, but you know, they're borderline. Um, come back and see us in two years. It's nothing super concerning at this time. Um, it wasn't until we got to genetics um, until, you know, the alarms were starting to sound um, on my son's future. The geneticist told us, you know, I think your son either has Hurler syndrome or Hunter syndrome. I'm not sure, and I could be wrong. Um, and at that point in time, I had really hoped he was wrong. Um, he said, you know, don't go home and Google this. Um, it will terrify you. And of course, I went home and Googled it and um, was devastated, heartbroken of a disease that I had never even heard before. Um, and that didn't have a very good prognosis. Um, it is a disease, it's a lysosomal storage disorder. Um, and so my son's not able to make an enzyme that um, breaks down the byproducts of tissue, collagen production, and just cellular metabolism. So those byproducts build up and they destroy the cells over time. Um, and it's a very progressive disease. Um, it is important that it's caught early, which is why it is on the uh, recommended universal screening panel uh, for newborn screening. Um, and he was diagnosed with Hurler syndrome at nine months. It was very rapid um, when we get to treatment. So you start enzyme replacement therapy as soon as possible. He had a port plate um, when he was nine months old. We started four hour infusions weekly, traveling back and forth to Philadelphia. And then he, um, the treatment currently um, is just to, it's not a cure, but it is to extend his life expectancy, which, um, Historically, with no treatment, it's five years old. So he's already exceeded the natural course of this disease um, with treatment. And the treatment is a bone marrow transplant. So then we had to go through um, getting a match. We had a donor fall through. Um, and then he has to go through really gruesome chemotherapy regimen um, to wipe out all those bone marrows to accept the new donors. Um, and then when you go through a bone marrow transplant, you essentially, he's bubble boy. From that point on for about a year, we lived in isolation. So as Senator Poor said, you know, um, we are now starting to live things that we've already lived through. Um, my family specifically, we were in isolation for about a year and a half because of severe immunosuppression. Um, and then, um, so right now he is doing relatively fine. Um, he, his donors, um, white blood cells do produce enzyme that are able to cross his blood brain barrier, um, which helps to decrease uh, cognitive decline. Um, he has had double hip reconstruction surgery last year. He's a year out from that. So he's able to climb walls and swing and run and ride a bike. Um, he had his surgery done here at AI DuPont, which actually uh, Dr. McKenzie um, at AI DuPont is one of the leading orthopedic surgeons for lysosomal storage disorders, specifically for NPS. NPS does have several different types. Um, and so with my son's diagnosis, I started advocating um, through the NPS Society and through NORD and the Every Life Foundation um, on a state or on a federal level. And, um, you know, I wanted to come back to the state and pr help advocate for the communities here um, in the state of Delaware. Um, I've also been working with the Newborn Advisory Council and uh, Hurler Syndrome is now currently on um, the newborn screening panel here in the state. 
along with uh, SMA and XLA, XALD. Um, and this 2020 was the first year where those three were added to the newborn screening panel, which is exciting. Um, my daughter was born in 2020, so she was actually able to get screened and she was featured on the NORG website uh, with a little story about our family and the importance of newborn screening. Um, like Jim Burroughs had said, um, one of the things, you know, right now is we've been living in isolation for so long. Again, it's something we have lived through previously um, and we're able to cope with, but with the pandemic, you know, my husband and I are both fairly healthy individuals. Um, with MPS, we do know that there is an increased risk of um, severe infection and not surviving. The data that we've been collecting um, through the MPS Society um, suggests that there is a significant increased risk of death um, compared to the general population. So we've been having to do school from home, doctor's appointments from home, as much as we possibly can from home to limit his exposures. Um, he is going to be six years old this year, um, so he does not qualify right now to receive a vaccine. Um, my husband and I are, again, you know, as Jim had mentioned, you know, healthy, younger individuals who are not able to receive a vaccine yet um, and probably won't until it becomes open to the general public. So um, that's really, you know, I feel like our families in this instance have kind of fallen through the cracks um, when it comes to um, being able to have access to the vaccination. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of things from home that we can't do, like physical therapy, really difficult to do from home. My son also has an autism diagnosis. So even just schooling and occupational therapies and speech therapies and all that is extremely difficult to do from home. And there are such significant limitations to virtual um, in the course of his development and education. Um, so a vaccine um, is definitely something that can help get us to um, a state where we can better take care of our son. Um, but with that, um, that concludes my experience as a patient caregiver and advocate. And so I would like to, is State Representative Paul Bombach here currently? Yes, I am. All right, I would love to introduce you. Um, and please, um, Irfan, do you have any details? I know you have a, an existing relationship with him. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, and definitely, I would like to welcome uh, State Rep. Paul Bambach. Uh, so again, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, uh, Rep. Bambach has been a great supporter of the rare disease community and the special needs community and has always been at the forefront to, to, to work with us uh, in terms of introducing any legislation. Uh, even though Paul Bambach does not represent my district, he's from District 23, Madison District, but his compassion uh, speaks volume. So with that, uh, Reb Bombach, uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Irfan. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know, I think uh, Lieutenant Governor Ha Long and I think State Senator Nicole Poor, um, I forget if there are others, um, but I just wanna, mainly I think wanna thank the families. Um, Irfan and his family introduced the issue of rare diseases to me. And I think one of the honors that we have as elected officials is to learn more and more about all that is in our state and for that matter in our country and world. Um, really eye-opening and heart-opening. Um, the stories that we, you know, we just heard, you just, you, it's so easy to put yourself um, in the, the shoes of a parent um, sharing the, the path that they're on. Um, and you know that there's no greater bond than between a child, uh, a parent and a child, and especially a child who has additional needs. So. Um, I want to thank uh, Nord. I want to thank the Delaware chapter of Nord, um, all the families for working together, all the families for reaching out to your elected officials to help us help you um, raise awareness, um, raise uh, the visibility of the, the issues that you face, the, the very uh, high needs that we have to make sure that the services are provided wherever possible. Um, for the greater needs that your families have. Um, it, again, it, is, um, it, it's, it hurts our hearts, but it builds our hearts to um, hear um, what you do for your families, what your children go through. Um, and 
it, it, it makes, I tell you, it, it is one of the most gratifying parts of our job is to see the, the, the um, how families come together, how communities come together to help those in need. Um, thank you for raising our awareness. Thank you for giving us um, a chance to do what we can um, to help your, uh, the, the challenges that you face. Um, you, you make us better people um, and you inspire others. Uh, you in, indeed, I, I, I love hearing about coming back to the state to, to, to help other families, um, to help them know that they're not alone um, and that uh, we all care. And it's not just words, uh, wherever there are deeds that we can do, uh, we are indeed uh, uh, appreciative of the opportunity to lend a hand where we can. Um, Irfan, uh, everyone on the call, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, listen, to learn, uh, and to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, I would like to introduce Irfan Patel, who is one of the co-ambassadors here for Delaware RAN. Um, he would like to share his patient caregiver and advocate experience with us. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, again, um, some of you have listened to the story multiple times, and I hope you, get, you won't get bored with this. So again, the idea here is to raise more awareness on, on, on these conditions. So uh, my wife and I uh, are blessed with four children and two of whom have special needs. So our um, uh, exposure to the, to the special needs and rare disease uh, world started when uh, my son uh, Yusuf was nine months old. So when he was uh, at birth, he was a normal child and his rare genetic condition did not manifest itself until he was nine months old. Again, it's a long story how he was diagnosed. I won't go into all the details. So when he was born in November of 2002, at that time, organic acidemia was not part of the newborn screening protocol uh, in the state of Delaware. Now it is, uh, but at that time it was not. So that's why uh, uh, they were not able to catch it uh, at his birth. So uh, again, going back to what uh, Stephanie mentioned, right? Uh, it's, it's very important to, to strengthen the, the newborn screening protocol. I think we have come a long way now. Uh, I'm really glad with that. I'm really happy with that. So anyway, so even Yusuf was nine months old, we were coming back uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, a family vacation in India, spending time with the family and parents. And then on the way back uh, on, the, on the flight, he was diagnosed, uh, uh, I mean, he went into a metabolic crisis and that resulted in an emergency landing in Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, a three weeks of uh, NICU uh, admission uh, in the hospital there. And after that, we had to fly back to the States with a team of uh, doctor and nurse. And as soon as we landed in the States, the first thing we did was we drove, we drove straight over to, to A DuPont Hospital for Children, which is Nimos, uh, Nimos now. And he was again admitted there for, for three weeks. And then they confirmed the diagnosis of uh, MMA, which is methyl melanic acidemia, uh, mutation zero. So uh, as uh, many, uh, patient givers, uh, uh, caregivers before we mentioned, uh, this, all these rare conditions come, come with this whole package, right? So even simple chores like, like eating uh, was, was difficult for him. He had lost all his milestones. Uh, uh, he had to go through an intense six weeks inpatient therapy at Kennedy Krieger Institute just to learn how to, how to chew and swallow. And then uh, he started with NG tube and then G tube, and he had his G tube until uh, he's, he's 17 now. He had his G tube until, uh, until last year. Uh, a central port was placed uh, 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 to make sure that uh, they have access for, for IV and blood draw and frequent hospitalization, OT, PT, you name it, right? These conditions come with this whole package. And as was growing up, uh, we, uh, there were always challenges in terms of his, uh, his growth. Uh, and then uh, MMA clearly took a toll on his, uh, on his liver and kidney uh, to a point that when he was uh, six years of age, uh, his kidney was only functioning at 50% capacity. And then we're looking at exploring the options for, for transplant. So working with, uh, with National Institute of Health, uh, we came up with a plan that uh, we need to look at transplant uh, as, 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 a, uh, uh, as one of the options for his, uh, 
to, to improve his, his standard of living. Again, transplant is not a cure because as we said, these are genetic conditions, so there is no cure for this, but uh, it could somehow help him uh, improve his, his quality of life. And while this was happening uh, at the hospital, uh, the, the team was so, so thin, so, so lean, right? They had to uh, uh, stop the, the bioclinical uh, geneticist services. And as a result, we were forced to look into other options outside of, outside of Nemours. So we had, to, we had two options, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, or Johns Hopkins, and then we, we chose CHOP because of the proximity, and then uh, we kind of like the, the focus on the pediatric care there. So we transferred our care to CHOP uh, from Nemours. Again, one challenge I want to highlight here is this, this shows the challenge that, that, that the, that the rare, disease, rare disease caregivers face, right? Because the conditions are so rare, and, and, and not every hospital or every facility is able to uh, cater to the needs of those, right? So again, we are lucky, uh, like Jim mentioned, right? We live here in the state of Delaware. We have a, we have a great support here, and we are lucky that within an hour of drive, we could get to Johns Hopkins or we could go to CHOP, right? So, so again, that's a challenge I want to highlight here. So, uh, long story short, uh, as we transferred our care to CHOP, again working closely with NIH and CHOP, uh, uh, we made a decision to to go for um, combined liver kidney transplant for for Yusuf, and he had his transplant back in uh, back in 2013. And now he's under the care of a multidisciplinary team at CHOP, uh, the, the GI team, the, the nephrology team, uh, obviously uh, led by the metabolic team, and then the, the endocrine, you name it, right? Uh, so multidisciplinary team. So the gap we see here is, again, there is a focus on the, on the, uh, on, on the medical aspect, uh, Right, and then there's also a huge gap that we see in terms of uh, the emotional well-being. We still don't have a a solid uh, resource, right, that we could that we could lean on to uh, for, for for emotional care for, for for the patient, right? Caregiver, obviously, they also need need the emotional support. I think uh, that's a different story. But even for the uh, for the uh, for the patient. So all, while all this was happening, we our third child, um, Khatija, uh, she uh, she was born in 2009. See, if you have four kids, you have, you have to take a second pause to, to get the right, uh, right years in your, uh, uh, in your head. So she was born in 2009. And obviously, uh, prenatally, we found out she had the same condition, uh, uh, MMA, much zero. And uh, since we didn't have a, a medical care facility here that could cater to, to this condition, we had to, uh, uh, my wife uh, had to deliver at HUP in Pennsylvania, uh, in Philly. And then as soon as she gave birth to Khatija, she was transferred next door to CHOP so that the metabolic team there can, can, uh, can take care of her uh, under the NICU protocol uh, for about three weeks. So again, Khatija also went through, her tra trajectory was so different. So that's another uh, nuances of these rare conditions, right? Even though Yusuf and Khatija had the same condition, MMA and same mutation, MUT0, but the trajectory for both of them was completely different. So her condition worsened much uh, in a much faster way compared to uh, her brothers. So she went into absolute um, uh, uh, medical uh, decomposition, if you will, right? Metabolic crisis uh, pretty soon. And then she was spending almost uh, every uh, other, uh, uh, every two weeks uh, of, of a month at the hospital. And then we had to start looking into her transplant options and she had to go through a, a liver transplant uh, uh, few years, uh, five years ago, uh, actually six years ago, or 2015. So she's now uh, again under the care of the multidisciplinary team at CHOP. So, uh, in terms of just to uh, bring the discussion back to, to to the challenges here, right? As I said, uh, getting comprehensive healthcare, right? In our cases, uh, I'm sure Jim and Stephanie and other and other uh, uh, rare disease uh, uh, parents here can 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 attest to. Uh, we as parents have to shoulder on all the responsibility in terms of how do we bring about this comprehensive view of the healthcare, right? So making the medical teams move away from the siloed version, right, on focusing on just one aspect. One good example is uh, Khatija, she went into, uh, she had some, um, um, so, some issue, uh, issues with her, uh, with the thyroids, 
And then we had to, I had to do a lot of research on does MMA cause a thyroid issue? And even that metabolic team at CHOP, they were puzzled. They thought they had never seen any, any patient, uh, MMA patient with thyroid issues. And then while doing research online, thanks to the internet and all these support groups, I found out there was one another case uh, in Australia where the parent had noticed uh, uh, the, the kid's hair falling and she also had the same MMA mutation zero. So that gave me uh, uh, some, uh, some context. And then I took it back to, uh, to the doctors and then they really jumped on it. And then uh, uh, that was taken care of. So what I'm trying to highlight here is, uh, there are, there are so many things that parents have to shoulder on. So I always say that when we go to a pediatrician's office here, for the other two non-medical kids, I mean, it's a cakewalk, right? But when, you, when we take our other two medical, medical kids to the, to the pediatricians, the pediatricians just sit back and they say, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Patel, uh, you tell us what's going on and you tell us what we have to do, right? So, so I think, that's, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, the, that's the magnitude of the, of the challenge faced by, faced by people uh, 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 in, this, in this community. And then looking ahead, uh, what's the path forward? There are a lot of research that's happening. Uh, again, we have been part of uh, a number of clinical researchers that's happening. Uh, Logic Bio is a company in Boston uh, who are doing some research on gene therapy. Uh, so we are hoping that all these medical advances would, would give us some uh, uh, ray of hope, right? And then uh, coming back to the soft challenges that we have is uh, gaps in the educational system. Uh, that's something, again, we can go on and on. We don't have time for that. And then as these kids transition to adulthood, there is a huge gap in the transition process uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, 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 I mean, as we, uh, as we move, along in this, move along in this journey. And the last challenge is, obviously we all know, I don't think it's a challenge only for special needs or rare disease community. I think it's a challenge for everyone. Navigating the whole insurance myth, right? So I was doing a, I'm big on Six Sigma and, and Lean. So I was doing, I was collecting some data points. So I realized that I spend at least six to eight hours every, every month just talking to the insurance. Just imagine nothing, nothing changed, right? These kids were diagnosed at birth. I mean, Khatija was diagnosed at birth and Yusuf was diagnosed when he was nine months old. Nothing changed, but still you had to navigate through. They're taking the same medications, maybe some additional new medications and stuff, but insurance is still a, still a big uh, a big myth, right? So, so I think that's that's a huge challenge. And then coming back to me, as you see here, you also see combined melanic and methylmelanic acidema, C mama. What is that, right? So, as I said, we go to NIH once in a few years just to uh, just to be part of their study. And then uh, by fluke, uh, uh, in 2015, they did some tests on me, and they said, hey, you know, Mr. Patel, you you have this new condition, this condition called combined melanic and methylmelanic, short form C mama. So my other two kids make fun of me, like, hey, dad, you know, we have MMAs, like, you know, like mixed martial arts and you have like C mama, right? So anyway, thankfully I have a very uh, mild version of it. And there are only, so far there are only, uh, I think 16 to 18 documented C mama cases, right? All over the world. So, so again, uh, everything is going fine for me, uh, thankfully. And they have told me to, to keep an eye on uh, any kind of, uh, impact on the nervous system as, as, a, as a age, right? So, so that's why I said, hey, you know, we, we um, uh, and I had to say that the day I was, I was told, I got this call from NIH, right? Uh, I still remember the date uh, vividly, it was 23rd of December, oh, sorry, 23rd of November, uh, 2015, uh, they called me and they said, hey, Mr. Patel, we just we ran your blood work and other tests and you have C mama. And that's the day I was so, so happy because I told my kids, hey, you know, I share something with you now, right? Something, uh, I mean, not, not in terms of uh, nothing compared to the challenges that's my kids face, but, uh, but still. So anyway, so I think those are the challenges I would like to highlight here. And then one last thing, uh, like I said in the introduction, it's all about connecting people uh, with these rare conditions across the globe. So one thing that we have been uh, finding is uh, the, the, the medical food is a big challenge, not just here uh, uh, in, in the US, right? Uh, in, in the US, the big challenge is coverage of insurance, right, uh, for, for medical food. Even in other parts of the world, the globe, uh, we have the support group for MMA where not a day goes by when we keep hearing about, hey, you know, there's one family in China, one in Chile or India, where they don't have this, this uh, life-saving medical formulas for their kids. And, and we had to come up with plans to, to collect 
we had to reach to Abbott Labs and other companies to, to, to provide for that. So it's all about connecting people uh, with the same challenges uh, from across the globe. Uh, so again, we are so thankful for, for the support we have been getting in the state of Delaware. Like I said, we have we have we are very mature, very mature in terms of our, our state report card, but still has some gaps that we need to we need to work on. And I think our DAC is really going to going to get us there. And again, thank you for your time for uh, for listening to the story here. Thank you, Irvan. Um, so in closing, as you can see with each of the patient caregivers and advocates experiences, there are a lot of underlying themes, a lot of challenges that are very similar, even though the diseases are very different. Um, it's why it's important for us as a community to come together here in Delaware so that we can share these experiences and try to make our lives better for our children, for ourselves. Um, and so if you would like to join us um, in these efforts, please um, contact either uh, me or Irfan. Our emails are available. Um, please follow us on social media. Um, we have a Facebook page. Um, and then we also have um, a website through Nord. Um, please contact us. Um, we look forward to your participation so that we can move forward together in um, changing some of the legislation, hopefully here in Delaware, that can help our families. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Anissa. Great, thank you. Um, after the event, we will randomly be selecting two winners from the attendee list to receive these Rare Disease Day swag bags seen here. Winners will be contacted via email this week and receive will receive their prizes sometime in mid-March. So thank you and good luck. And lastly, I would like to share a, a video to close things out. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At Nord, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the volunteer state ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to I, all I don't of think our the video is running yet. supporters for helping us connect with rare patients. Are you unable to see it? No, I was I saw it on our end. Um, yeah, it, it, I saw it on my end too. It's running perfectly fine. Anissa, you just want to finish it, and then we'll we can I, I'll put the link in our states. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At Nord, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. Nord support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, Nord, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at Nord, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community on Rare Disease Day and every day. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we appreciate you being here today um, and joining us for Rare Disease Day. Uh, I encourage you to check out the hashtags on social media, Rare Disease Day, and show your stripes. Today is officially Rare Disease Day, so there's a lot going on online. And uh, we thank you for joining us today, and, and, and we look forward to working with you all 
um, this year working with the Delaware Rare Action Network. And a special thank you to Irfan and Stephanie for putting together today's program and all the work that you put into it. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for sharing your stories. And of course, for our lawmakers that have joined us today to hear our stories and also work to support the rare disease community in Delaware. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye. Thank you.